All right. Thanks for being friendly. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 12, Bianca said I have to preach a short time today. We'll see. We'll see if that's even possible for me. But let's go to Mark chapter 12. We're looking at verses 18 through 27. I'm going to read it and pray, and then we're going to dig into and see what God has to say to us today. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. And Sadducees came to him, meaning Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and then he died, left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as, the dead being, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Let's pray. God, we come before you and we give thanks for this wonderful day and for the opportunity to open our scriptures and to hear from Jesus about his thoughts on resurrection. Is there life after death? And so God, as he is posed with this tricky question, uh, his answer tells us so much about what to expect beyond the grave and on into eternity. And God, we uh, pray that you would open our hearts to understand and to believe what it is that you are teaching us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we happen to be, well, we're going through the Gospel of Mark, which is a biography of Jesus, an eyewitness account of Peter, probably Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, uh, recorded by Mark, John Mark. Um, and, uh, and so we're just working through this book, and, you know, typically a lot of places there's like a Lent series, there's a, there's a we, we spend a lot of time thinking about Passion Week, and uh, we're actually, because we're working through this gospel, going to end up spending about 13 weeks in Passion Week. We've spent a couple already, and so instead of doing like a special, like, resurrection message, we actually happen to uh, land on a passage where Jesus is asked about res- resurrection. So we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at Easter week, so to speak, over the next couple of months, actually. And so we're jumping right in here. We're just continuing with our series. So if you're new with us today, you're jumping in on a series, but I think uh, this will make sense anyway. We're on Tuesday of Passion Week, and uh, uh, so Jesus is going to... Uh, so if you think of Passion Week, the triumphal entry on Sunday... And then he clears the temple on Monday, and then Tuesday. That's where we're at here. He's going to die on Good Friday, going to rise on Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and we're on Tuesday of that particular week. He's come in messianically, he's cleared the temple, and now there's conflict. And uh, this conflict reminds me a little bit of the 2014, uh, the scene from 2014 movie Captain America, The Winter Soldier, where Captain America is stuck in the elevator. And people keep packing in, and his spidey senses, I guess that would be Spider-Man, his American senses, or whatever, uh, are, are going, something's not right. And he, as the doors close, he makes this statement. He says, before we get started, does anyone want to get out? And he's going to be ambushed by all of these guys. And then there's the, this awesome fight scene, and of course, Captain America defeats all of them, right? And that's kind of similar to what we have here. Jesus is in the temple, and he has up rooted things. He has he is, uh, overthrown things. He's come in declaring himself to be the Messiah. And now the Sanhedrin, the ruling, the, the Supreme Court of Israel is now challenging him and they're seeking to ambush him. And so we're in the middle of an ambush right here where they are sending waves of different people to come and question Jesus, to discredit him. We saw already in the previous text uh, that we looked at last week where he was challenged on authority uh, on uh, by what authority he does these things. He's been asked about paying taxes to Caesar. And now we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees are coming up. And the Sadducees are, well, well when you think about the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin are like the Supreme Court. They're, they're ruling the temple. And they're made up of multiple parties. There's the Pharisees, there's the Herodians, and there's the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, 
The Sadducees are kind of unique. You look at verse 18 here. The Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. So the first one got defeated, and now they're bringing the Sadducees over. The Sadducees party is coming to ask their question, trying to discredit Jesus. And they asked him a question saying, and before we get into the question, I just want to look at the context. I think, do I have a slide here that kind of shows where we're going to go? We're going to look at the context first. I've already started doing that. We're going to look at the question then that they posed to Jesus. Jesus' response And then the point, what is the point of this text, of Jesus' teaching, and what is the call for us? Okay, so those are the five stages of this particular message here. And uh, that's a picture from Peter's Instagram of him actually arguing. I actually think that's a painting from the 1800s, a famous painting of this particular moment in Scripture. So the Sadducees are a party of the Sanhedrin. They're part of the religious elite. We don't know a lot about them because their writings didn't survive. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, so did everything we basically knew about the Sadducees, except what's recorded in Scripture and by Josephus. There's just very little that survived of them. But they're the elite, they're the rich, they're the scholarly, they're the theologians, they're the, they're the high priestly class. Um, they do not believe in angels or life after death. So they're religious Jews, but they're fairly secular, if we were to use our terms. They'd be fairly secular. Really, only things exist in this life. They're materialist. They're rationalist-oriented. They believe that the soul dies when the body dies. And they believe that only the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, is authoritative. So they don't believe the rest of the texts there, the rest of the Jewish writings. Only the Torah is authoritative. So this this is a very interesting group of people. Uh, they're not as popular as the Pharisees, so they're, they're definitely the minority view. When they argue about resurrection, they're definitely in the minority. The common people um, do not really follow the teachings of the Sadducees. They t- tend to follow the teachings of the Pharisees. And so those two have been in conflict for quite a while. In fact, in the book of Acts, Paul's going to use that disagreement to get himself out of some persecution when the Sadducees and Pharisees fight over the resurrection. And so they decide to bring this question that they've been arguing about for a while to Jesus because if they can get Jesus caught in the crosshairs here, if they can discredit him and end his following, then that would be, uh, that would be ideal for them. So then they pose this question. Here we go, verse 18. The Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. They asked him a question saying this, and they give him just this absurd situation uh, in order to discredit res- resurrection. Verse 19. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother there were seven brothers the first took a wife and when he died left no offspring the second took her and died leaving no offspring and the third likewise and seven left no offspring last of all the woman also died in the resurrection when they rise again whose wife will she be for the seven had her as wife and so this is meant to be kind of a gotcha question and what they're referring to is actually Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 7, where there was a provision in the law of Moses that if a woman who didn't have a lot of rights, didn't own property, was, would be very vulnerable if her husband died, especially without a son to care for her, without lineage, the inheritance of the father could be lost, the wife could be destitute. And so there was this provision in the law called leveret marriage. Leveret marriage. And here's how it reads. This is just straight from the book of Deuteronomy. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall, be mar- shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Don't let her just wander off. You need to care for her. And you need to love your brother enough to continue his lineage, his inheritance, especially in the land of Israel where your land and your prosperity is tied to, to, to a place, to your lineage, to your family, to what tribe you belong to. And so her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. So this would be important in a very tribal society. And, uh, and it makes sense. It, looks, it seems weird to us. This is not something that we would commonly do here. But this was in order to protect the family lineage, to pre- protect the inheritance, to protect God's people. And so this was actually a provision to make sure that death didn't wipe out a family line, didn't wipe out an inheritance, didn't leave anyone destitute. And so what they're doing is the Sadducees are taking this law of Moses and they're going, well, let's just dream up a scenario in where, where they're following this particular law, but then when if they die, all seven of these brothers die, there's no heir, whose, whose wife will, uh, will, um, will she 
be, sorry, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And it's, it's really meant to be a scoffing and absurd question to try to discredit the validity of a Christian belief. It's to try to take a scripture, create a really creative interpretation of it in order to discredit the idea of resurrection. Because it would just be absurd. It would be mind-blowing to think of a, particularly a woman being a polygamist in the new heavens and the new earth. Certainly God would not allow that. And this is sort of a gotcha question. This is not a legitimate question. Um, it's pointing to a real thing that Jesus is going to get to. But really, this is just meant to be one of those kind of goofy questions. A question like this. Can God create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? Well, no, actually. Can God beat himself in a fist fight? Can God think up a mathematical equation too difficult for him to solve? All right? So those are all questions that kind of get at something, but they're really just meant to be absurd. And of course, Christian belief is absurd, if I can come up with a question like that, right? Well, that's actually not a fair way to do it. C.S. Lewis says nonsense is still nonsense even when we speak it about God. And so that's where Jesus is going to go. He's going, this is a nonsense question, right? You are quite wrong. And in fact, progressive and liberal Christians do this quite a bit. Take one particular verse of Scripture and try to creatively interpret it in such a way to discredit a core Christian belief. So we actually see this happening quite a bit today. Progressive and liberal Christians do this all the time. Of Take one thing in Scripture and then blow it up caricature it, and then try to undermine Christian, Christian faith. You'll see this all the time, using the Bible to create scenarios in order to undermine the Bible. And so that's what exactly what they're doing to Jesus. This is not a new tactic. This is pretty normal stuff. And so Jesus has brought this, is resurrection real? That's the real question. Is resurrection real? We don't think so. We think it's absurd. We think our scenario, while possible, discredits any rational idea that there could be a, rec- a resurrection and what these guys have done if they, is they have deified and made inerrant their own presuppositions and rationality. That because resurrection doesn't make sense to us, therefore we reject it. Right? They make their own presuppositions and their own rationality. Like it's just not rational to think of a resurrection from the dead. And they've so made their opinions and their rationality the standard by which they judge truth uh, that they are actually missing it. Jesus says they are going to be quite wrong. They're not just wrong, they're quite wrong. They're very wrong. They're tragically wrong. So these Sadducees present an abs- the absurdity of a polygamous woman, woman in order to undermine any idea of there being a resurrection. So that's who the Sadducees, that's who they are, that's the context of this question, all right? Just this powder keg of pe- Passover week, trying to discredit Jesus in front of all of his followers, trying to undermine his ministry by creating this, myth, this little absurd riddle by which to undermine Jesus. And here's his response. Here's what he says in verse 24. The response Is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Then he goes on to say, after he gives his response in verse 27, you are quite wrong. This is very interesting. Jesus is very direct here. And what I see here in just his response is we see one judgment. We see two problems that he pulls out and then three truths. Three truths here. So those are probably all on the screen there. Let me just unpack them for you. First of all, his one judgment of them is that they are what? Wrong. Not just wrong, but quite wrong. Just doubles down. Which tells us that Jesus believes that there is such a thing as objective truth. That religion is not just up for whatever you feel. Not all religions are equal. No. You are wrong on resurrection. It is real. It is true. And you are wrong. There is objective truth and you have missed it. You are wrong. You are quite wrong. So there is such a thing as objective truth. The two problems that he sees, the reason that they've missed it, that they've missed the objective truth that they're believing the wrong things that will condemn them is number one, you are terrible at reading your Bible because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You, there's two problems that are leading you to a wrong, condemning conclusion about God and theology. You're very religious, you follow all the rules, you follow all the Torah, but you do not believe in the resurrection and there's two fatal reasons why you are quite wrong and you're leading others in the wrong direction. You're terrible at reading your Bible, and your God is way too small. You deny the power of God. You know neither. You don't know your Bibles, and you don't know God. I have a book on my shelf written by J.B. Phillips called Your God is Too Small, and it's a very small book, which is wonderful. It's a great little book, but it just, it, it just challenges the assumptions that all of us have, that all of us have far too small a view of God. He's very manageable. He's very easy for us to put in our boxes. He's very predictable. And he goes, your God is way too small, and your faith is too small. 
your perspective on your own sin is too small because your God is too small. And that's exactly what he has. You have a God who can't resurrect the dead. You don't, you don't even think about it. You just, your God is so small and you're terrible at reading your Bibles. Which tells us that when it comes to this objective truth that they're quite wrong about, the place that they are to get it is from the Bible, from the scriptures, right? The reason that you're wrong is not because of rationality or these different things. You do so many of the right things. You know so much and yet, you don't know your Bibles and you don't know your God. Which tells us that ultimately it's from the Scriptures. It is God through the Scriptures that tells us what is objectively true, what is savingly true. It's not catechisms or creeds or church history or tradition. It's the Scriptures. Because they have all of this. They have all the writings, all the street, all this stuff, and they misunderstand the Scriptures. That's why they're wrong. They're wrong. Because they do not understand the Scriptures and they have a small view of God their absolute naturalism, their personal rationalism has caused them to miss the truth and miss badly on what is true and what is real. Make sense? That's the one judgment. You're wrong. You're outside. You're not even close. The reason is, is because you don't study your Bibles very well and you have a small view of God. So all your religious stuff, all your leading the temple, all of your religion, all of your cute little sayings and clever little riddles, None of that. You're all quite wrong because you don't read your Bible and your God is too small. Here's what he says, verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. We see three truths here. First is that physical physical bodily resurrection is real. He says in verse 25, for when they rise, not if they rise. Oh, the resurrection's real. You've missed it because you don't read your Bibles very well, but hey, when they rise... From the dead, and he'll go, come back to that in just a second. But bo- physical bodily resurrection is real, according to Jesus. The second truth is that human marriage ends at death. They will neither marry nor are given in marriage in the resurrection. In the afterlife, there is no marriage in the same way that it is here. Human marriage ends at death. That's why we say, tell death to us part. In fact, human marriage pictures a greater reality. Ephesians 5 tells us it's a picture of Christ in the church. So at some point, human marriage will dissolve and it will fold into the great marriage of Christ and his church in ways that are far beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And actually, it will be fully fulfilled in Revelation 19 when we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. As part of that, it says that we will become like angels, but this is only in relation to marriage. Sometimes you hear that at funerals, that God must have wanted another angel, right? Um, that's, that's a good sentiment. Don't correct people at a funeral. Don't correct their theology at a funeral. Just grieve with people, right? But when you hear things like that, just know, just know that that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that we become like angels. We, be, we remain image bearers. We remain I- image bearers as we are today. Angels are a different class of beings. But in relation to marriage, we will become like angels. And so this, Jesus, right here, Jesus refutes what is the teachings of Mormonism and Islam, which both teach that there is polygamy in heaven. That there's marriage beyond the, in, the, in, the, um, in the afterlife. Um, the way that they get around that is by saying that it's only the Sadducees, those that embrace the Sadducees' teaching, will not be married. But it's actually Jesus, I think, is very clearly here saying that, no, actually, you are wrong, not just on resurrection, but you're wrong on marriage. So those of us that are married and happily married and enjoy marriage, enjoy it in this life. It's meant to be a picture of Christ in the church. It's one of the greatest human relationships that God has given us. And yet, it ultimately folds into a much greater reality. And the God who created marriages is also able in the eternal state to create something just as great, just as wonderful. So for those of us that might grieve that thought to some extent, to go actually, no, there will be no loss in terms of heaven, in terms of that, uh, in terms of that. Um, So this scenario that they're creating of this polygamy in heaven and who will she be married to, he goes, actually, it doesn't work like that. There's a discontinuity between this world and the next world. You will still be yourselves, but in relation to marriage, it won't look like it does here. So that's the second truth. The first truth, physical bodily resurrection is real. Second, human marriage ends at death. And third, God keeps eternal covenant with eternal people. And this is where he goes now, verse 26. He says, as for the dead being raised, so he returns to that. He goes, okay, so your scenario is wrong on a bunch of areas. It's wrong on marriage. It's, uh, let, me, let me clarify that. But let me also point you to what it says about 
um, to why it's wrong on resurrection. God keeps eternal covenant with eternal people. Look at verse 26. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush? I like how Jesus says that. You know that part in the Bible where it's like the talking bush part? (laughs) So Jesus just goes, like, just uses that memory device there. How God spoke to him saying, "I I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So Jesus is going back to Exodus chapter 3. And remember, what five book, books of the Bible do the Sadducees believe in? First five books of the Bible. So he's like, let's go to the scriptures that we actually agree on, that are authoritative. Okay. He, he's like, you don't know the scriptures. We've got a whole lot of issues, but at least right here. And that might be a good apologetic that is we're working maybe we work from try to try to work from common ground when we're trying to correct people it's like okay we both agree we both agree here that exodus chapter 3 is authoritative and so let's just think from exodus chapter 3 jesus says about what god says and actually it points you to the fact that there's a life after death and a resurrection if you had been reading your scriptures carefully you would have realized that god is saying something about himself and abraham isaac and jacob That is really important and actually applies to our understanding of resurrection. So he goes right to their scriptures, draws from exactly the place that they would agree is authoritative and shows them how their conclusion is wrong. And here's how Jesus does it. Exodus chapter 3, look at verses 4 through 6. Okay, so the context of this is God's people are in Egypt. They've been enslaved for 400 years. Moses um, has been miraculously uh, protected as a baby, grew up in Pharaoh's household, killed an Egyptian, and then had to flee. He had to flee out to Midian for 40 years. And then on the backside of the desert, God calls Moses. And Moses is going to be the deliverer of God's people. But this is the moment where God calls him. There's a burning bush. And, and Moses draws near. And this bush starts speaking to him. A voice from the bush starts speaking to him. And it's the Lord God. It's the Lord God. It's the covenant God of Israel. And here's what, it, here's what is said in Exodus chapter 3. When the Lord saw that he, meaning Moses, turned aside to see, God saw... God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place that you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And then God goes on to talk about how he's going to, how he knows about the the stuff that's happening in Egypt, how he's going to deliver his people. And then, and then he continues on in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am the eternally present being. I am who I am. I Yahweh. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you, me to you. God has said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me. Just notice in that bush, what does God say over and over again? I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He says it three different times. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God always speaks here in the present tense, which is mind-blowing. Because Moses is 400 or more years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because they still live. I am who I am. I keep covenant. I keep promises because that is who I am. And there are promises that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have not yet taken hold of, but they still live. And they will be resurrected. They did not cease to exist. They will be resurrected. They will come to life because I have covenants to keep with them. And Jesus is drawing on that going, if you had read your Bible, if you had paid attention to what God was saying, you would have known that he was speaking in the present to these people. I am the, 400 years later, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I keep covenant with my people. I don't keep covenant with non-existent beings. I keep covenant with people who are real who are alive, and they live. The covenant isn't fulfilled yet. I have made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm not done fulfilling them yet, and you're his children. You're entering into those too. God is not a liar. They live now, and they will be resurrected one day to receive the promises that I gave to them. Hebrews 11 actually speaks of this. 
Hebrews 11 unpacks this a little bit. So this is what he's challenging with the Sadducees. You should have been reading your Bible and paid attention to what kind of God God is. God keeps covenant to living people. And he keeps, and those whom he keeps covenant with, he preserves forever. And he resurrects them. He brings them back to life that they may share in all of the promises and benefits. Hebrews 11 talks about this. Look at for Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of that same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Did Abraham receive a city? He didn't. He died. So he's still looking for the promised city. Skip down to verse 13 in Hebrews 11. These all died in faith not having received the things promised. So either God does not keep his promises or they're still alive. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but have seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged them that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Skip down to verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said through Isaac, shall all your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead. Resurrection, right? The God of Abraham believed in resurrection, you Sadducees. He believed in resurrection to the point that he was willing to offer up his son. He had faith. Why do you not have faith? You say that you follow the five books of Moses. You say that you follow the follower of Abraham. Believe what they said. Believe what they believed. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of, jo- but of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And it goes on. The end of chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40 says, And these all, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Did not receive what is promised. And if the Sadducees are right, then those in the Old Testament that died in faith, looking forward to this, God broke his promise to them. God is not the covenant-keeping God. They died having not received their promises. But I'm telling you, God keeps his promises, and you want to know why? Because they're still alive. And they're going to come back to life, and they're going to receive everything that God promised to them. And that's exactly the point here. Though all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So those that have died are waiting, are awaiting a resurrection, and they're waiting for God to finish gathering all of the people. The reason that they haven't received that, the reason Christ hasn't returned, and these saints have not been resurrected in their new heavens and the new earth is because there's still some people, maybe even in this room, who've not yet repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ. God has been patient to wait to fulfill these promises so that more people might come to faith, might come to Jesus, might be brought into new life. It might be that God is delaying the fulfillment of some of these eternal promises because he's still waiting for you to respond in faith to him. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what he's drawing on. If you'd have been reading your Bibles, you would have believed like Abraham. You would have noticed that God told you something about his eternal plan. That the dead are not really dead. And they will rise again because God has made promises. And he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You are quite wrong. And you're so wrong that you're going to miss out on eternal life. Oh no, resurrection is very real is what Jesus is saying. So here's the point. Point number one, there is life after death. There is life after death. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Point number two, our marriage relationship with our spouse dies at death. That sounds sad, but there's a greater glory and a greater reality than even human marriage. So treasure your marriage, but don't worship it. Treasure it, but don't worship it. Worship what it points to, which is Christ and his church, right? And marriage can't be ultimate because we follow a Savior who is never married. If you have to be married to be fulfilled as a human being, then even Jesus wasn't fully fulfilled. The most fully fulfilled, perfect human being wasn't married. So therefore, marriage can't be the point, right? It can't be the ultimate point of everything. So treasure it, but don't worship it. Worship what it points to. Point number three, our covenant relationship with God does live forever. While our marriage covenants have an expiration date, God's covenant never does. And not even death 
will stop God from keeping his promises to us. That's the real hope at a funeral. Is not, well, I guess God needed another angel. All right, fine. No, God keeps his promises. And those who die in faith will rise. And they are present with the Lord. And they are receiving the beginning, only the beginnings of their reward. God keeps eternal covenants with eternal people. If you enter into an eternal relationship with God, it is eternal. Even though you can't see this, the other side of it yet. And point number four, Jesus teaches and trusts and accomplishes the resurrection. What Jesus teaches on this Tuesday about resurrection is what he's trusting on as he gives his spirit up to the Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He himself dies believing and trusting in the resurrection. And then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, he accomplishes it. What he teaches on Tuesday, he trusts on Friday as he goes to the cross for you and me. And on Sunday, he accomplishes it and guarantees it for all of us. Including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At the resurrection of Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob celebrated because their resurrection is tied even to Jesus' resurrection. God keeps covenant with his people. And what Jesus teaches on Tuesday, he trusts on Friday and accomplishes on Sunday. So here's the call for you and me. Two things. Two things that I'll unpack. Number one, believe Jesus. His identity as the Son of God, that's what Mark has been trying to get us. He is the Son of God. Believe in him. How much evidence do I have to give you? He is. Believe in him. Who he is what he taught, that resurrection is real, that he's come in the flesh, that he is God incarnate, that he must go and suffer and rise again. Believe that and believe that he actually did it, that he died and rose again. So this whole, everything, everything about Easter Sunday, everything about Resurrection Sunday, everything about Passion Week, everything about the scriptures, everything about Mark, everything about this passage, this question from the Sadducees drives into, will you believe Jesus? Will you believe in him and what he teaches? Yes, it sounds crazy that people rise from the dead. Yes, it seems crazy. But if you know the scriptures and you know the power of God, they will drive you to Jesus. This is the only way to know the power of God. Philippians 3 says this, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Right? You know neither the power of God nor the scriptures, Paul saying, I do believe them. I believe in, and in Christ, I will know him. I will know the power of God in the resurrection and I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Coming to Jesus and believing in him, his identity, his teaching, his death and his resurrection is the only way to really know the scriptures and the only way to really know the power of God. That's where the Sadducees missed it. And if you're not careful, you might miss it. But you have an opportunity, Jesus is staring you in the face through his word. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's the only way to know the power of God. And it's the only way to know the word of God. John 5, 39 through 40 says, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is this, that they bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He might be speaking to the exact same people here. You don't actually even know the scriptures until you know me because they point to me. One pastor said, all theological error is from a lack of knowledge of the scriptures and the power of God, particularly in the person and work of Christ. The second call for us is not just to believe in his identity, that's the most important thing, but also now to live in light of his resurrection. Live in light of the resurrection. Imagine if it's actually true, that the scriptures are true, that the power of God is true, that Jesus is right, that what he did actually happened. Just imagine that for a second, and here's, what 1 Corinthians tells us, verses 13 through 15. So if we agree with the Sadducees that there is no resurrection, here's the consequences. We just read it a few minutes ago, but I want to highlight it again. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. This was just a waste of your time, I'm sorry. And your faith is in vain. For if we... For we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. In fact, it says that you're still in your sins. You're still headed for hell unless resurrection's real. 
But then he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of many who have fallen asleep. For as, as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Every single person will be resurrected. Their spirits united with their bodies, either to eternal life or eternal death. Either to new heavens and the new earth or conscious torment in hell. All of us will be raised, either to life or to death. What kind of resurrection will you receive? One commentator says this, The fact that man can engage the interest of God, can speak to him, enter into covenant with him, be loved and embraced and protected by God is proof of immortality. Because God lives, he will live also whom God loves. There are many arguments that go to prove immortality, but this is chief, that God loves man and delights in him. God made us in his image to exist eternally somewhere. And what we do with Christ determines that, which destiny is in front of us. So my friends, on this Resurrection Sunday, what will your response be? Will you come to know the power of God in the scriptures by repenting and believing Jesus Christ? You will indeed be raised to eternal life or eternal death. Which will it be? Let's take a moment, just bow our heads and respond in our hearts to what, what we've heard this morning. Oh God, we thank you that the Sadducees asked Jesus this question. And while they asked it with bad motives, and it's such a bad question in many ways, we thank you for the response of Jesus. And God, it confronts us to think, what do we believe? Do we trust only in the material world that we can see? Do we trust only in our own rational thoughts? That if it doesn't make sense to us, therefore it must not be true. God, I pray that you would help us to hear the scriptures and submit to them to believe that the one true God is big and powerful and that if he has spoken to us through his word, then he has also come to us in the Son, in Jesus Christ. And if he's come to us in Jesus Christ, then he really did die in our place uh, as a, to bear the wrath against, uh, against our sins. And if that's true, then he must have risen from the dead and therefore we must bow to him as king, as Lord and God and king. And so, Lord, I pray that we would just logically put those pieces together and we would not be like the Sadducees and be arrogant and prideful and think much of our own thoughts and not consider the possibility that maybe it's true. And if we'll grab it by faith, we too might experience the power of God. We might too enter into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us break down our pride, confront us with your word, and give us faith to believe, and God, help us to live in light of the fact that Jesus is raised, and we will be raised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Of the